people. Dickinson is producing a thinking society, incredibly energetic, incredibly inquiring, and, and very critical. My impressions of Dickinson's sustainability is so impressive, so heartfelt, so encouraging. I'm absolutely blown away by the, the commitment of the students, the faculty to enlighten, to enhance a better world for us all. If we don't address it in a major way soon, it may be too late. Good evening. How about that video? It's just fantastic. Uh, it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome you to our 12th annual lecture honoring the recipient of the Sam Rose Class of 1958 and Julie Walters Prize for Global Environmental Activism at Dickinson College. I would also like to welcome the many alumni, parents, and friends, and other colleges and universities joining us this evening via our live stream. We welcome you all to Dickinson College tonight. Recording will also be available to share with others at the conclusion of this session this evening. This year, the Rose Walters Prize honors Tara Hauska, a tribal attorney, land defender, environmental and indigenous rights activist. I know you'll enjoy hearing from her this evening as I have thoroughly enjoyed my time with her today and when uh, Tara was with us on uh, campus uh, earlier this year. As you saw in the video we just watched, this prize was established by our good friend Sam Rose, class, as I said, of 1958, and Julie Walters, two remarkably devoted Dickinsonians whose passion and commitment to protecting our environment and to raising awareness of the dangers of climate change are inspiring. While Julie and Sam are not able to be with us tonight, I hope and I think that they're watching us on the uh, live stream, two really dedicated people. Please join me and let them hear uh, your gratitude for their incredible ge generosity and dedication to our college, to our planet, and for supplying this prize. Please join me. Thank you, thank you, Sam and Julie, wherever you may be uh, this evening. Over the course of this residency, many of you have had or will have the opportunity to interact with Tara. Uh, she is uh, really gracing us with an extended uh, stay on campus, which is just marvelous. She's gonna be participating in many classes and small group lunch discussions with faculty and with students, a soup dinner at the Treehouse, and even a workshop for student leaders on organizing and advocacy. I would now like to introduce uh, uh, Preruna uh, Patil, who will introduce our speaker. Preruna is a Dickinson student. Uh, she's a senior majoring in environmental science with a minor in chemistry. She's been very engaged uh, on campus in a number of organizations, and I might say she's also engaging, having uh, dined with her tonight. Uh, in, in these organizations, uh, uh, she has done well, and she's participated uh, in myriad ways, but she is also, of course, an accomplished student here at the college. She was the recipient of the First Year Seminar Excellence in Writing Award and the Schumann Award for First Year Excellence. She is also a Presidential Scholar and a member of the Wheel and Chain Senior Honorary Society. What a, what a great uh, a record, and, and you haven't even left us uh, yet, which you will at the end of the school year. Perhaps most appropriate for tonight's presentation, uh, Prerunna uh, conducted research last spring with Professor Alyssa Decker, focused on adopting indigenous knowledge for urban management plans with a special focus on the Colorado River watershed. So, you're on. Uh, time for you to do your turn uh, in uh, introducing our speaker tonight. Pray Ryan. Good evening. My name is Prerna Patil, and I'm a senior environmental science major and undergraduate researcher here at Dickinson College. 
Before we begin, we must acknowledge that Dickinson College was founded on the unceded territory of the Susquehannock peoples. We hereby recognize the prior status and the enduring diversity of this land and the many indigenous nations that stand in relation to it, particularly the thousands of indigenous children from dozens of nations forced or coerced into the reprogramming camp established at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in 1879. Dickinson endorsed and gave material support to these cultural eradication efforts. Turn of the 20th century presidents facilitated land acquisition and charitable donations, while others conferred honorary degrees to two CISS superintendents. Dickinson faculty delivered lectures and classes both at CISS and on campus. This relationship represents our failure to have recognized in these peoples and their nations different but no less self-sovereign ways of thinking, living, and being. We recognize and take responsibility for the college's support for this attempted eradication of indigenous peoples, a profound moral failing in stark opposition to our mission today. No single acknowledgement is sufficient to the task before us. Accordingly, this living land acknowledgement is incomplete by design and under revision by necessity. It reflects our need and desire to learn from these from these histories and the indigenous communities that carry them. To act consciously and responsibly with that knowledge and to sustain our commitment to this process by regularly reviewing it. While our knowledge remains incomplete, the process of turning honestly toward our history continues to animate our acknowledgement today, even as it orients us to a war towards a more just tomorrow. The violence of settlement, the forced relocations of tribal nations, and the cultural erasure program of the CISS are stories we must recognize, share, and attempt to reconcile with our own. Yet these histories do not diminish the ongoing stories, continuing sovereignty, and enduring strength of indigenous nations and people. The interrelated histories of this land lean firmly against easy characterization and the comforting simplicity of a single story. We thus offer this in-process living land acknowledgement with deep humility to the many and varied indigenous nations and peoples who by choice or force called this land home. Tonight, I have the incredible honor and joy to introduce this year's recipient of the Rose Walters Prize for Global Environmental Activism, Tara Hauska. Born in International Falls, Minnesota, across the, sur across the shore from the Kuchiching Reserve in Ontario, Canada, Tara is a proud member of the Kuchiching First Nation and stands as a fervent advocate for the intertwined causes of environmental protection and indigenous rights. Tara earned a BA, BS, and a magna cum laude JD from the University of Minnesota. From there, she went to Washington, D.C., where she served as a tribal attorney to the Obama administration and later as a native policy advisor to the 2016 Bernie Sanders presidential campaign. Tara also co-founded Not Your Mascots, an advocacy group and social media campaign directed at dismantling racist indigenous representation in sports. From there, she committed to direct action with full-time nonprofit advocacy in Standing Rock, North Dakota, as she worked against the Dakota Access Pipeline. She stood and protested there for six months and helped raise legal funds for arrested water defenders. After Standing Rock, she would return to the front lines to, protect, to protest Line 3, a pipeline that cuts through the wild rice and wetlands and sacred indigenous land just three hours from where Hauska grew up in northern Minnesota. In 2018, she formed the GNU Collective, a woman in two-spirit-led resistance dedicated to defending the sacred, advocating for systemic change that respects indigenous sovereignty, and prior prioritizing land defense, traditional knowledge, and divestment to protect the earth. Tara underscores that the GNU Collective is not only focused on defending the land and training folks in direct action, but on getting people onto the land to understand what they're defending. I'm an environmental scientist, both by trade and by nature, and until very recently, this meant a much different thing to me. To me, science has always been a, a series of questions, an exploration of a natural curiosity, but as I began my schoolwork in a remote field station in the Caribbean, this definition of science began to expand. As I learned about the indigenous history of the island while reading Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, my understanding of environmental science shifted into this innate investigation of one's world, an investigation that contributes to a canon of knowledge that has been developed by indigenous people for thousands of years, and one that specifically develops my connection to my own environment. 
In my Keystone research paper for my urban sustainability class, I wondered, how can we grow resilient, listen to indigenous voices, and build a connection to the land as we urbanize? Tara, Tara emphasizes this connection to the land and the pertinence of balance. She believes that environmental and indigenous activists should focus on taking action, but do so in harmony with building a relationship with the earth. She has been featured in All We Can Save, The New York Times, CNN, Vogue, and Indian Country Today. She's a TED speaker and the recipient of the 2021 American Climate Leadership Award and the 2019 Rachel's Network Catalyst Award. Tara Hauska is a force of hope and determination and pragmatism. She has and continues to mobilize thousands to follow Native leadership. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Tara Hauska. Just in the nick of time. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys. Thank you for that really nice introduction. Um, and thank you guys for having me back, too. It's awesome to, to be here and share space with you tonight and for the coming week. Um, I'll say this, which is, I think, uh, Sometimes folks expect a more, uh, how do I put this, formalized presentation. Uh, for me, I'm actually really curious to hear what you guys are here, you know, and what, what's driving you and what you're interested in hearing about um, that I might have a comment on or a thought about what it is that you're, that you're undertaking, which I'm sure is an incredible volume of work. Just in a little bit of time from hearing from really, uh, it, they, they were a little bit shy, but from hearing from students so far, um, you guys are really doing some really amazing things, and it's uh, exciting and hopeful to see that work unfolding. Um, so, Buju Ginua, Shevaway Kwe Indijinaka, as Makwondu Dame Gochiching and Dunjiba. My name is Tara. I'm Bear Clan from Kuchiching First Nation. Um, apparently, we're actually not that far apart from each other, right? Canadians? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I have some pictures to, to frame the talk. Um, since there are quite a few students in the room, I'll just say this. Uh, I did not have that impressive of resume anywhere at all in my undergraduate uh, time. I uh, was a first generation college student and um, thought I would have a bunch of different majors, and I did end up actually getting three of them, um, but I changed like six times, and it took the registrar asking me, like, you are not going to register for classes until you tell me what you're doing. <laughs> and I had, like, they had all of my papers spread across their desk, and they were, what are you doing? What is it that you're doing? I was like, well, I'm pre-med. I have that. <laughs> like, that's one thing. Um, yeah, so ended out, like, with uh, 218 credits of everything I could possibly imagine of what I wanted to learn when I was in school. Uh, liberal arts is a really uh, deeply formative time of my understanding of critical thinking and uh, relationship building. And although I did not do that that great, that still got me to the next step of uh, law school instead of medical school. And uh, then on into graduate school where I still owe one paper for my Master of Laws um, that I will get in at some point when I'm maybe not living quite like this. Um, yeah, and ended up going, you know, to D.C. and, and working under different administrations and on Capitol Hill and getting a really uh, firsthand look at governance, which was pretty shocking in a lot of ways. Um, I thought maybe there had been, uh, I guess I had like a, a presupposition that it was going to be a little more respectful and a little more um, formal, and instead seeing behavior that was quite shocking to me. Um, even thinking, like, you know, in my head, like, oh, it's a corrupt place. It's like, oh, you didn't vote for my bill, so I'm not going to vote for your bill. And these are bills that actually affect people's real lives, right? Like, that was really eye opening for me. Um, and then the ignorance around Indigenous peoples, around, uh, you know, issues of 
what to me was like presented as uh, resources, right? Like this conversation around resources and almost no understanding of what that actually means in practice and in proximity to those resources, right? I had grown up in a place where, and I'm actually technically not even really from International Falls, that's the town next to us, it's the big town of 4,000 people. It's a bustling metropolis, we have a couple stoplights. Um, I'm from a town of 200 people uh, outside of it called Rainier um, and grew up hunting and fishing and with the forest all the time. Um, and having a real culture shock around real basic questions like, so where are the wells? You know, where are you guys pulling your water from? And they're like, what are you talking about? You know, what? what? <laughs> like, okay, maybe that's not a thing here. I should work on my accent. That used to be really, really thick. Um, but yeah, so being in DC and kind of having that culture shock even more so, um, and watching you know, this conversation that has been ongoing since colonization of broader society wanting something, indigenous people saying no, and sitting across the table and having that dialogue again and again with an outcome of, well, we hear your no, but we're gonna do it anyway. We're gonna take it anyway, we're gonna do what we choose to do. Um, which was, you know, how I ended up out in North Dakota um, to a place I'd never been before on the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation, uh, standing with folks who were fighting the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, it was a very big change from my cushy office in DC, um, but it was one that I think felt like the land calling me back to come bring all those skills back home. I mean, that was one of the last conversations I had when I was thinking about what do I do, you know, what's my next step? And I had a couple job offers and some of them were at home and some of them were in DC. And one of my elders was, who actually is in this presentation, he looked at me and he said, um, well, go to DC, go get a bunch of skills and you'll be fine and we'll stay in touch and come back, you know, bring, bring what you can learn back. Um, and so that was my return back that I didn't really plan or see coming, but loading all of your stuff into a rental car is a kind of a whole experience, for sure. Figuring out how I was gonna get my cat out to DC, or out to, out to Standing Rock from DC, um, and my dog, my greyhound who lived on front lines for months. Um, but yeah, that led me to continuing on with that work, which I viewed to be this um, really powerful method of creating pressure and creating um, resistance around what happens when you say no and they proceed anyway. You know, what are you, what are you left with? What are your options? You know, there's many ways that all of us can be involved in this fight for our survival as a species. Um, and the role that I found myself in is one of, you know, trying to defend and also trying to like, you know, un defund, right? Like I found this to be really effective advocacy methods, but there's also like the, the back end of solution making and you know, trying to stop this from happening in the first place. But um, yeah, I've found that in all the advocacy techniques I've engaged in, this one, I mean, it's amazing what you can do with just 10 people, let alone in this situation that you're seeing right here. This is 500 people who overthrew a pump station for the Enbridge Line 3 tar sands pipeline and stopped the pipeline for that day. Um, and actually a couple days after that, getting that um, firsthand connection of, I think the, uh, the climate crisis can feel really, uh, you can almost feel powerless inside of it, right? Like this is unfolding, it's rolling, and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and faster and faster, and it's, Folks aren't moving fast enough. They're not making decisions fast enough. They're not adopting policy fast enough. They're not, people are thinking about all these things and they're working through them and they're creating something incredible like the Paris Accord, but they're not actually following through on it. You know, and in the meantime, we're destroying the wetlands and the rainforest is being deforested and, and all of that. And this is a moment where you see someone, and I've watched that moment again and again of, someone feeling deep connectivity with the earth and feeling like I did something today. I did something in this moment. I stopped a multi-billion dollar industry today, you know, by doing just this. 
Um, these folks actually were just uh, with this incredible structure here. Um, this is the first time it was deployed in North America. One of the women that's up in that structure um, just went through her court process fighting the Line 3 pipeline. She took it all the way to trial. Um, earlier today, we were talking about uh, you know, the, the court process, and uh, your president was a judge. And I think you would have been shocked, as I was, to see what unfolded in the courtroom in northern Minnesota. It was, uh, I hate to use the word kangaroo court, but that's what it was. It was really shocking to see some of the things that occurred in that courtroom and that were allowed. Um, she was ultimately found guilty, which I know I, I, I've written about how I think we have to, uh, or at least we should be in a moment of beginning to question or hopefully already ongoing, you know, going through this process of questioning where we are as a species that depends on water if we are incarcerating, jailing, killing the people who are trying to defend it and trying to bring voice to nature, right? Which is the basis of my work and so many other folks. You know, we're, we're trying to give voice to the, the beings around us that we depend on too. Um, I think there was some pretty, you know, I included this one, it's, it's just to think about, um, you know, the structural fabric and the societal fabric of, of where we are um, here, specifically being uh, the United States um, and these grabs at democracy that are happening in, in very real time. Um, I think something that was quite shocking in Minnesota, besides just, you know, the level of brutality and stuff unleashed on us by, you know, police officers and private, private security, um, was that the democratic uh, administration created an escrow account to basically facilitate the company paying police officers for any expenses incurred in the Line 3 demonstrations. So you know, it was $8 million ultimately that got billed to Enbridge by our local law enforcement and by the Department of Natural Resources. Department of Natural Resources is actually the biggest recipient of these funds. Um, it, it was a, I think it still stands as a, you know, what level can they get away with of influencing and you know, um, reaching into these institutions that are supposed to be for the public's interest, right? Um, and that's happening, you know, all over. You know, there's all these little grabs of power. So the folks down in Atlanta who were just charged with RICO lawsuit, um, the folks in Appalachia who were just hit with a slap suit, a strategic, strategic lawsuit against public participation. Um, I've allegedly been almost named in one of those lawsuits. Uh, they couldn't serve me because they couldn't find me. But <laughs> <laughs> um, my lawyer was like, well, I was like, so should I? He was like, no, I mean, you technically don't have an address, right? And I was like, no, not really. And he was like, I mean, I don't know where you are, right? You just have an email address. I was like, cool. Um, we'll just stick with that. There's benefits to being off-grid. Um, so I wanted to, to discuss this because somebody brought up today, you know, just the, the stories and being surprised at what, what folks can get away with. This is my driveway uh, during the Line 3 demonstrations. Um, these folks showed up at my driveway to tell me that my driveway was no longer a driveway and that uh, to gain access to uh, my home, where I was housing lots of different folks, you know, and had lots of visitors, um, that we would have to do it by foot, that we would no longer be allowed to, to drive in. Um, as you can imagine, it was quite contentious, and there was a dozen people arrested in my driveway that day. Um, and it became, uh, our, our lawyers put it as the most policed easement dispute in the history of Minnesota. Um, ultimately, the sheriff did lose, which was a moment, you know, we were over Zoom and I got to watch a very, I, you know, he was on mute, but I could tell there was a lot of upset there, um, but permanently enjoined from blockading our driveway in the future. Um, yeah, that took a while to win. Another role in the movement, that's very critical. Um, 
these are folks that I just, I want to show their faces and for folks to think about, you know, I mean, I, I think there's so much, I always get asked about, you know, what do you need from us? How can we help and all that? There are many ways to be involved in the movement that's uh, happening, not just here on Turtle Island, but all over the world, right? Like one of the biggest needs, of course, in, in this place is the, p the people to actually find bravery and to stand. Um, oftentimes it's like 10 of us out there, right? Or a dozen of us, or maybe 20 of us. Um, and still causing that much of an impact, right? To like the larger societal pressure that we can bring against an administration or against a project. Um, but there's also other ways, you know, like this is a way to support the folks who have taken these incredible risks for, um, I know, the rest of us, right? Like that's one of my dear friends, Victor. He's been incarcerated uh, for seven months now in Atlanta. He was unloading some camping equipment and tackled and tased and beaten up by police. Um, that's Jessica Reznicek. She, was, uh, she is a Catholic worker who was arrested resisting the Dakota Access Pipeline. She uh, was charged with the felony terrorism enhancement and they ultimately sent sentenced her to multiple years in federal prison. Um, and this is Tortuguita who was murdered in the uh, demonstrations against the uh, training facility that was proposed in Atlanta, and still is, right? Like, I think, in particular for people that are watching Democracy, um, some of the pieces around what's occurring in Atlanta are really quite frightening. Um, you know, people being jailed for uh, running bail funds charged with terrorism, people being jailed for flyering, um, them going to the extremes of, they did the whole process, you know, the public process of, um, okay, well, if you're not gonna let us cancel the training facility via pressuring the city council, let's go for a referendum vote, we'll put it to the people. Well, then they went through, okay, well, we, you got your 100,000 signatures, well, now we're gonna do signature verification, right? And like, what does that actually look like in a place that's currently also looking at voter suppression and some pretty big issues involving a former president. Um, that's still unfolding and I think it's one to watch really closely for folks looking at democracy um, and the grabs at power of, of uh, what it looks like when you stand up to an industry. Um, this is where I'm at now, so this is where I'm from. Um, this is where me and baby Joe are living. Uh, it's a, we were at a moment of the line three struggle where I went home and saw my parents who I hadn't seen in months. And they were like, are you all right? You know, is everything all right? I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so tired. Um, but I was thinking about already, you know, like what, what happens next, right? I mean, these, whether it's infrastructure fights or you know pushing against an industry or um, even pushing for like the the policy change that's so needed, I mean it can be quite draining, right? Over time, and you you're fighting for sometimes multi 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 years, decades to make some small change that actually does have wide-reaching impacts, but it's still very hard won. Um, all that to say, it's not easy to to just we won. You know, it doesn't quite work like that, and I think that's something that can be really hard when you're looking at creating change, you know, for all you folks that are so young and stepping into this space. Like, change is hard. It's a hard one, and sometimes you're there in that right moment, in that right space, and you have those skills, and you can add that voice, and you can be that voice, um, and bring your expertise, bring your knowledge, bring whatever, whatever fire needs to be heard to, to push it over the line, right? Um, but I was thinking about how we were, we had pushed the administration, the Biden administration, so hard, and we'd gotten to the point of forcing the Army Corps of Engineers to come out and walk the land twice during the pandemic. We had pushed to the extent that, you know, we had all these, we had created all these relationships with the transition team, and we had been lobbying them for months and months and months, please stop this project. Um, going up and up and up the chain and talking with, you know, Gina McCarthy and like those types of folks who are expressing their concern around growing civil unrest, right? And I'm like, okay, well, if that's your concern, we're not gonna, we're gonna keep going. But we had reached a moment where I felt like I knew um, 
the administration just wasn't listening. You know, they weren't they weren't going to do what we wanted them to do. Um, what does that mean when you reach that moment? You know, and I was thinking about how you know it's a long-term fight and it's a lifetime fight for many people. Um, there has to be space for land defenders to take a moment, you know, and have some respite and have some rest. Um, there has to be a moment for us to continue to actualize the community that we built, right? Like that's, part, that's the other part of the work I think that's so critical is building community, building the space, building the places to carry each other and hold each other and, um, you know, reconnecting, growing food, growing uh, community, feeding and doing mutual aid work and care work and all of that, all those things that we're trying to build, I think, in that better world, right, of inclusivity and um, kindness towards each other and empathy. Um, so I started looking at, okay, I mean, maybe I should think about like what, I, what I'm gonna do and I went home and then I see like this post you know, like a, on a bulletin board for a piece of land that was for sale. And I asked my parents to bring me over to that spot and then we, I put, we put tobacco down by one of the cedar trees, it was an island, um, and ended up securing that in 2021. And then this piece of land, which is like this beautiful property that's been held in a family since it was homesteaded. So it was not split up and turned into multi-million dollar mansions, it just stayed this old kind of like, I think it used to be a logging camp. I'm trying to track down the history of what it actually was. Um, but it was a resort for a little bit of time. So it's got like six cabins and a main lodge on it and all of that. And I was like, I wonder if I could do that. I'm very pregnant at this point, but I could do this. I've got time, right? <laughs> I've totally got time. Um, and we closed on this in January of this year. So that was a very big moment of, all right, here's some, here's some next steps. Uh, it's time to set about the work of continuing this um, effort towards reconnecting people and healing and, and building the kind of skill sets that I think can, can help folks in, in the, the crisis that's unfolding in front of us. Um, so we've been busily doing that for the best, last bit of time. This is what I was doing right before I came here. Um, this is my teacher, Paybomb, too. He's the guy that told me to go to DC. Um, Longtime teacher. Uh, this is wild rice that we were parching and harvesting. Um, I was literally parching up until the moment that I drove to the airport uh, that my parents drove me. Um, I think, you know, for for folks that are engaged in environmental issues, environmental science, studies, whatever it happens to be, one of the pieces I see that's missing is, at least in broader you know, uh, solution-making circles, is this almost wired in now at this point, like hardwired in sense of, um, it's all just numbers and it's all just figures and it's all statistical analysis and if we just do this thing, that'll fix the problem. And coming at it like, uh, like a math problem to be solved, right? I think the disconnection of ourselves from the reality of nature is what got us there in the first place, right? Like they, we forgot apparently that we need to drink water to live. We forgot that we can't endlessly exploit from the earth without consequences. Um, I hope that more folks spend time, you know, thinking about that reality, you know, and, and spending time with nature, spending time in dirt, you know, or, uh, you know, I mean, I thought about that when I was walking around in DC, right? Like you're, you're, the earth is so controlled in those spaces and so manipulated, it's really hard, right, to, to feel that connectivity through your, through your shoes and the concrete but it's still there, right? I mean, I spend a lot, like, at least a, a significant amount of time in rooms with banking institutions and insurers and all those folks that are funding the industry and I usually at some point or another remind them that the room that we're sitting in is manipulated concrete, you know, it's manipulated earth. The glass is sand, 
their clothes or maybe there's polymers in there, but they're also, that's all just manipulated earth, right? Like everything in the room is coming from one place. And sometimes I can see one of them just kind of like looking at their shirt, like, and you're like, yeah, that's, <laughs> it's, it's all around you every single moment of every single day. Um, even though you've con convinced yourself in this air conditioned room that it's not, that you're not entirely dependent on the only home we have. Um, so finding methods of, I think, trying to, to center those realities in, in ourselves as we're doing our work. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think building, building the world that we want to see, walking with empathy. I spend so much time trying to always center that, and no matter where we are, of, of empathy and, and meeting people with kindness, you know, seeing the, you know, it's, it's come up a few times today, even like this kind of, um, I don't know, it's almost like a viciousness that I see, like that's, that's present, or like, a, like this anger and fear and all of that, that that's especially rising in you know, US society, but it's bleeding out throughout the world. You see the rise of fascism everywhere, um, and these ideologies of it's their fault, it's these folks' fault, or it's, you know what I mean? It's, it's somebody else that, to blame. Um, I think there's so much to be said for acts of empathy and kindness towards each other. And that's a lot of, I mean, this work that I'm doing with you know, chaining my body or whatever it happens to be to a machine, I mean, I think that those are acts of empathy and kindness also. You know, in a world that's going through so much change and is um, reacting to a lot of the, the choices that human beings have made, I mean, I think those acts of love are so deeply needed. Um, in climate crisis, that somebody has taken that step and physically reminded the earth that somebody's willing to protect you. You know, we're, we, we do that in many ways, but I think that that is a, one that to me is deeply impactful to the person taking that action too. Um, and yeah, lastly, I will say, I always get asked from students uh, about, you know, what can I do specifically? And I did make the call to, you know, I think there's, there's a need for, for more of us to try to separate ourselves from our privilege and our individualism that's present here in this particular society. But I also think um, there are ways to do something in this space that you are right now, which is engage in mutual aid work. That's really, really helpful. Um, find out where your college is invested, where your endowment is invested, where your board of trustees is investing. Um, those are real things that have real impacts and are ways that you can show up as a student who is paying for your education. Um, you have a very strong voice. I've seen many a student overtake their board of trustees um, and force them to stop investing in fossil fuels. and. Uh, mining and all the extractive industries that are not good. Um, so yeah, Let's see where we're at. I think I'll leave with that. But thank you, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Tara, for uh, sharing uh, some of your wisdom with us, uh, helping us to learn. Uh, we're going to take some time now uh, to take some questions. Um, and as an undergraduate institution, we'll uh, give priority first to questions from our students. <laughs> Hi, Tara. Thank you for coming to speak with us tonight. Um, I was wondering, here at Dickinson, we have such a big focus on sustainability, but at the same time, we're also trying to focus within the American Studies Department on decolonizing our campus. Are there any suggestions you have for how we can connect those two goals? So one of the things that we did at our camp and that we continue to do in the space that we're in, our, our long-term space, is make every single person that walks through the forest and into our, into our fire circle, you have to sit, in through, sit through a decolonization training. 
And that for us has just been listening to different indigenous voices talk about what decolonization means to them. Because it means something different to, to lots of different people, right? And you're gonna get different perspectives and acts and, and um, opinions on that. Decolonization to me is an entire way of thinking and it's one that's not easily gotten in just a simple act. It's actually a lifetime of trying to unlearn some of these colonial patterns that we've ingested and are taught from the moment we're born, right? To consume and to take and to not think about where it's coming from. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, it, working with this new center that's coming up, hearing from different indigenous voices, hearing from folks who are working with the land in a really direct way. Um, I don't think that decolonization is specific to necessarily one people either, right? Like I think there are people that are in deep community with the earth are already kind of thinking a completely different way, right? Like they're thinking seasonally, they're thinking with respect to nature and not necessarily with what our lives are, right? Like that we need it at this time at this, but you know, it's like, no, <laughs> the harvest is coming when it's coming, right? Like that's a decolonial thought. So I don't know, try to find a variety of perspectives and yeah, there's ways to do things. There's also, I think there's a difference too between decolonizing and indigenizing, right? Indigenizing is kind of like putting it on top of what's already existing. Um, decolonizing is a lot harder. It's much deeper work. Hey, um, thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one with older family members who are resistant or unwilling to have these conversations and are kind of turning a blind eye because it may or may not affect them in the future. Do you have any advice on how to approach those conversations? So in the region that I'm from, extractive economy is the economy, right? So I've got loggers and miners and all those kind of folks in my family. Um, the way that I've found of common ground to reach them or like to sit at least in a place where they're not angry and whatever with me is um, they're also hunters and they're fishers, right? And that is a point of connectivity that, how's the trapping going? You know what I mean? How's the fishing going? Oh, it's not so great. I wonder why, what do you think is going on? You know, and then they like kind of are, well, yeah, I mean, I know that all that's happening, but you know, it, like people do know, I think at a very deep level, you know, like everyone recognizes at least at some point, like that something is amiss. New York is flooding or whatever, Maui's on fire. I mean, those things are huge things, but and it's not weather, right? But um, whatever you can do to try to find common ground and, and reach people, and it doesn't necessarily, like the, I, I, when I'm talking with folks at home, I don't talk about climate at all. And I'm not using those words. It's just talking about nature, which they understand very deeply. Um, I mean, I think that that's a point too of just um, advocacy, which is, Something I see a lot of, uh, I won't say liberals, but liberal types take a misstep with, which is coming into a very rural place and thinking that like rural people just don't get it. You know, that, oh, it's the deep red place, like they don't understand. It's like, no, they, I guarantee the farmers and the hunters and the fishers know exactly what's happening, you know? They see it and work with it every day. It's not statistics on a page, it's like the reality, so wherever you can find commonalities, meet people where they're at. Thank you so much. Um, I was just particularly struck by the instance of federal police forces blocking off your driveway and I'm wondering in those particular instances where federal law systems kind of overstep tribal law systems um, and overstep and ignore the sovereignty of land, what systems are there to keep them accountable for those actions? Or are, this sounds like a very naive question, but are there any systems? I mean, that's where we turn, I think, more broadly to like the international community. Um, you know, the, the federal government has a very long history of overstepping and stomping on indigenous rights pretty regularly. Um, and sometimes in broader society, like global society, you find more purchase 
Um, one of the more effective instances of like global solidarity in this work was um, when the resistance was happening against Dakota Access Pipeline, you've got all these folks coming from all over the world, right? And many of those folks are indigenous from different places. The indigenous people of Norway, the Sami people, went home, and the Norwegian oil fund is one of the largest oil funds on the planet. Literally trillions invested into fossil fuel infrastructure and expansion and development all over the globe. They were able to successfully get us a meeting to talk with the pension fund, and so we were able to have that meeting, and then the pension fund brought us back because they were so appalled hearing like what was happening, right? Because like their accountability mechanism is, well, Dakota Access says everything's great. Like, what are you guys talking about? And it's like, well, here is our UN report, and here is our pictures of like people being blinded and shot with rubber bullets and cannon, water cannons and dog attacks and all of it. On the second, after the second meeting, Norwegian Oil Fund announced that it was thinking about pulling out of fossil fuel infrastructure projects, which was like the whole market was wild for a couple of days. Then they ended up walking it back to any projects where a certain percentage was um, brand new exploratory drilling. All of that like found a basis in solidarity. So I think I look internationally when I can't find that accountability mechanism here. Um, that's where relationships with like the UN shaming the US and all that can be really helpful. Um, yeah, and also just the broader public. I mean, they start listening when a whole bunch of voters are telling them this, this issue matters to me, right? Because they want to keep their jobs. So yeah, that's accountability too. It's a little bit harder, but it's there. Oh, and I promise to tell more stories, too. I'll tell a funny story while you're grabbing. There's a gentleman here who's got a question. Um, so on that tip with the reaching somebody who is maybe not on the same page as you, so allegedly I was in this situation where I had been arrested and a bunch of us were on the side of the road and we we're like all like kneeling, you know, and with our like little handcuffs on waiting, and the police officer comes over and he's like super aggro, right? He's like you're never getting out of jail, and your little friends aren't bailing you out, and blah, 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 and you're never getting your cars back. And I was like, he's lying. And he's like, and how would you know? And I was like, because I'm a lawyer, sir. And he was like, ugh, and just like walked away, right? Like, so mad. And then his other friend, like his other like colleague walks over, and he's like a local guy, right? Like, they oftentimes bring in law enforcement from somewhere else, just like they bring in pipeliners from somewhere else, and like, it's gotta be from somewhere else because of the connectivity is, I don't want to destroy my land. I don't want to like, you know, throw my neighbor in jail. Anyway, he comes over and he's like, you know, why would you do this? You're like a lawyer from DC. What are you doing out here? And he was wearing like a Rapala kind of like vest over his outfit. And I was like, Rapala is like a fishing brand, right? Like they sell lures. I was like, so you like fishing? And he was like, yeah, I love fishing. I love fishing with my son. And I was like, oh, I'm from Rainy Lake. And he was like, start telling me all about like going to Rainy Lake. I was like, so you ever fish in the Bakken? He's like, no. I was like, why not? Oh, it's so contaminated. The water up there is so, you can never get a fish out of there. And I was like, right. And then he could like watch like the like little wheels going and he was like, oh my God, wait, if this, if, wait, this could be like really bad. And I was like, yup. And then he's like looking down at me and like my handcuffs and then like looks down the line of like the rest of us. And he's like, this, I, I'm gonna go. And he just like walked away, <laughs> like walked away. So like that's negotiating with someone who's in a very different position than you, but like meeting them where they're at, right? Like he's a fisher guy. Let me talk to him about fishing. Um, so you previously mentioned that um, indigenizing and decolonizing are two very different things, but even then the concepts um, like depend on well, the person who's talking. So what is decolonizing, like what does that mean to you? That's a whole other lecture. Um, but in short, I think to me decolonizing, um, the simplest way I can put it is uh, as a human being recognizing that we are in a web of life, that we are not in this structure or even in this structure, but we are literally in a web. And that means we are dependent and codependent with every being that's on this planet. Um, and if 
our portion of the web becomes really sick or starts pulling and is too heavy or whatever it is that the rest of the web can't function. So that is, uh, I think, the easiest way I could put it. Thanks for me. If you start recognizing that, you're recognizing that you're, you have, you are, despite our giant brains convincing us that we can like build societies that are not dependent on the earth, we are absolutely 100% dependent on nature. And it, nature doesn't care if, you know, we build giant sea walls. You don't think that a hurricane can <laughs> deal with that in the way that it, it should, you know what I mean? Like, it's just... I don't see how we're going to buy our way out of like tornadoes and ex extreme shocking weather events. You know, we, we can't do that. We can't throw money at the problem. Um, nature doesn't work that way. Um, thank you so much for coming and thank you for your service as an environmental defender and professional badass. Um, I personally am interested in going to public service, and you had mentioned your child, baby Joe, and I was wondering what you aspire and hope the next generation of public servants and politicians look like and what values they bring into that realm, and from your experience in D.C., um, how you want that environment to change, to bring about not only the systemic change we need to see, um, but just in accurately representing the needs of the people. I mean, overturning Citizens United would be a huge step towards that. Like that's, I think, the, the crux of so many of these really uh, extreme partisan issues that have occurred, right? Like where you see something like water and environment become politicized. Like, one of my, that first internship where I was under the Obama administration was with the Council on Environmental Quality. Nixon was the one that created the, the NEPA, right? Like that was, that was a different time apparently when science was still science and it wasn't politicized. Um, I think the influence of special interest groups into politics has created a deeply corrupt and um, deeply harmed system of of representing the people, right? Like there are still really good people that are in that system that are doing their best with what they can, right? Like trying to pass little addendums and like pieces, sliding it in onto omnibus bills and like, you know, adding in riders. Um, some people are really evil doing that too, but there's also the good guys doing that. I mean, I think I hope to see um, that specific piece be overturned, and if not, I would love to see um, a generation that is more deeply involved with locality-based politics. Um, with line three, five people decided to approve that pipeline project in Minnesota on the Public Utility Commission. Five people. Largest tar sands infrastructure project in North America. That's what it came down to, right? And they're being heavily lobbied, heavily influenced. Um, I would love to see more engagement with that and like the folks that are at the utility boards in general, like they're responsible for overseeing the grid, right? And like what happens if folks want to go to wind, if they want to go to solar. Um, I would love to see that. I'd love to see a generation that um, is resistant to mirroring the same economies of, that has gotten us here in the first place. Like, the Inflation Reduction Act, huge criticisms I have around that are that it models and mirrors the exact same systems of extraction that got us here, right? Like, huge investments into mining precious minerals, huge investments into perpetuating that industry, you know, and then throwing block grants at people after the fact, you know, calling that environmental justice. That's not, it doesn't, the block grant doesn't really help when you don't have clean drinking water, right? Like, it doesn't really help if your sacred site has been mined under and has fallen in on itself, right? Like that's, yeah, I hope to see those, those uh, voices speaking out and refusing to accept the status quo.
Thank you so much for the talk and for everything you do. I just wanted to ask, not to be the pessimist in the room, but do you think that there is time to change what has been happening to actually, I know, you know, the UN reports and, you know, we don't have enough time and, you know, time is running out, so I just wanted to ask. Yeah, the, the global boiling language was really hurtful, right? Like, that hurts your heart. It hurt my heart to read that. And when you're in spaces with world scientists, you know, and one of my majors in undergrad was heart science, you know, it's, it, you know what's happening and you know what tipping points we've already passed. Um, you know, and seeing the, I, I mean, I see nature crying out in so many different ways, right? Like all over the globe, consistently on a daily basis. It's not just the big moments like Maui and New York, like those are places that people, you know, are seeing in like a really broad mainstream audience, but it's happening on so many different um, territories and places all over the world. I think that's where, at least for me, I really find a lot of hope and strength and love in seeing folks deeply caring for each other and like building communities that we want to see, even as that's happening, right? And even, and even as we're fighting to protect what's left. You know, that does give me hope as a species that we're still trying to do the right thing, even as we are paying for the consequences of so many actions before this moment. Um, and then doing our absolute best to try to stop the exacerbation of the problem, right? Like, that's, that's what this work is really about for me, is how do we at least make it not as bad, you know? And also teach some skill sets about, you know, what does it look like to retrofit a 100-year-old infrastructure? What does it look like to grow your own food and learn how to do that and to gain skill sets that I think are really going to be needed. And especially as we see like these questions of climate refugees and the reality that, that the migrant population is already feeling those pressure points, um, those are big moments, I think, where empathy really plays a huge role in what we choose to do. Thank you so much for this whole conversation. I, uh, I've been Dickinson for a long time now, 12 years. Uh, my son was eight weeks old when we came, so I have a very clear memory. Um, and I'm thinking a lot right now of the first Rose Walters Prize conversation we had where Bill McKibben came, and Keystone XL was just getting started, and divestment was just getting started. And he stood on this stage and he said, it's worth fighting pipelines, and it's worth fighting this one pipeline, because you know, we should stop this pipeline, and also we need to change the social license given to pipelines, uh, and the sense that this is an okay way to develop. And, so, and then during uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline battle, actually Wuna Luke came, and she talked to us also about this kind of, so I feel like we have this kind of ongoing conversation about pipeline battles here. Uh, and she was talking to us about also just like throwing kind of wrenches into the gears as much as possible. And I was wondering from where you are, where we are now in the pipeline battles, do you feel like the, there has been a change in the social, social license given to pipelines? Is there a way that fossil fuel like, I can see some big continuities, not going to lie. Uh, but are there places where it's no longer uh, an expected form of development or an OK form of development? Are there places where this is embarrassing now that it didn't used to be embarrassing? I'm just kind of wondering how that conversation has shifted from your sense. Yeah, I don't think any, anybody was thinking about pipelines even before Keystone XL, right? Like, the communities that were experiencing them certainly were. The communities that were experiencing, you know, fracked gas lines blowing up, yeah, like, they were definitely talking about pipelines that are underneath our feet all over the place, right? And there, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of pipelines that are already, you know, under us and corroding and all the things, right? And then the next, I think, where the social license comes in that I see is, like, oh, well, the obvious thing to do is we should replace them with a new safe pipeline. I'm like, no, the obvious thing to do is to transition away from fossil fuels and stop building pipelines, right? Like, that's, 
the obvious thing to do. You have extracted more fossil fuels that if we burn them all, we will be no more, right? Like, you've extracted more than we could ever possibly consume at this point. Um, endless expansion and exponential growth is not a reality. Like, those are not concepts that have any place in, in reality, right? And those same folks, I'm sitting across the table from them as they're telling me, well, I'm not living in the real world, you know? Like, well, I'm a banking institution, and you're not living, there's an economy, you know? And I'm like, okay, well, I'm living in a world where you have to drink water. And apparently, I have to remind you of that with my, you know, very inept brain that walked, that somehow got into your office because of the, like, thousand kids outside that are, like, <laughs> locked to whatever, you know? But I'm sitting here reminding you that you drink water. You know, I think that the, the social license of pipelines in particular as an infrastructure fight has become a more readily understood um, issue ever since, especially Keystone XL. I mean, I was, that's actually where I first started becoming involved and went to my first protest. I haven't been protesting my whole life. I did not protest in college at all, ever, not once. Um, I went out to DC and started working on all kinds of issues for tribal nations, including Keystone XL. And, saw what was going on basically and out in the world and it was shocking. Um, but yeah, I think people understand pipelines a lot more easily. I'll be going to visit the Mountain Valley Pipeline after this, just putting that out there. It's not too far away. It's really not. Us folks could really use our help. I think we'll take one more question. Thank you so much for your talk, and it was wonderful to hear from you earlier today. I think we're all going to learn a lot while you're here for the, the two-week period. Um, something I see a lot with students is anxiety um, about a range of these issues. So you've raised a range of things that we all need to be concerned about. You've talked about glimmers of hope, but could you possibly leave us with a hopeful message uh, for this group, please? Yes. <laughs> I mean... Okay. To be fair, to be fair, working in environment is, it's a tough scene, right? Like every person in this room that works on anything concerning knowing the science of the environment, it is a tough, tough scene. Um, and for the folks who are not working directly in the environment, the environment is still touching your life every single day, every moment that you are breathing and walking the earth. Um, I think the hope that I don't know, because I, I, I remember, okay, I'll tell a story, how's that? So I'm sitting outside the Public Utility Commission and we're uh, protesting for the umpteenth time you know, at the Public Utility Commission office. We've already given 98,000 comments, public comments submitted against the Line 3 pipeline. We have given thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of testimony against the Line 3 pipeline. We are now inside the offices of the Public Utility Commission who has unanimously approved the Line 3 pipeline, right? Um, for so many protests along the way, right? Like all the years of that. And I overhear a woman in front of me that just says like, I don't know what to do. I've been making art, I've been making food, I've been to all the protests, I signed all the things and we're still here. Like how does that happen? You know, and then I look across the room and I see a bunch of new folks who are, you know, in a very different place, right? Like they're like, oh, well, this system was never going to work anyway, you know? Like now we're going to continue doing what we've been doing, which is building resistance and building movement and building community. Um, I get enormous hope from seeing folks that are in these situations. Um, still finding like so much strength and power and laughter and joy um, as so much is happening, but that they can find a way to feel the impact of their actions, um, that someone can feel the impact of, you know, we pressured and pressured and pressured and we got this bank to pull out of the project. We pressured and pressured and pressured, and we got the Army Corps to walk the earth, you know, with us and to see what their what what their decisions are doing. 
we pressured and pressured and pressured, and this is where, at least for me, like a lot of it really comes in. So many people heard our call across Turtle Island and felt drawn and compelled to come out and stand with us during a pandemic, during a moment where we had to do COVID protocols in a camp without running water or electricity. And you still hear at night like the sounds of campfires and people laughing and singing and sharing space and music and stories and all that care with each other and food with each other. I mean, those are really powerful moments of joy, you know, as so much chaos is around you. Um, I think there is so much hope in seeing folks reconnect to the earth. You know, even if the science is telling us one thing, you know, um, those moments of connectivity are so deeply profound. You know, I think they're calling to the reality of who we are as, as a species of this earth, right? Like where you see that deep, powerful connectivity. Um, yeah, I think that's hope, you know, it, it really is. Um, I have a little one, right? And to me, it's meeting someone I've been fighting for. And that's, I have so much hope for the world that she'll walk into and the community she'll be part of. Yeah. Please join me in thanking for <laughs>